Good morning, Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. I see my volume working, so hopefully we've got that all taken care of today. Our opening scripture this morning comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. I know that many people have had good sermons about that and poor sermons about that. This is only one of the uh, of the Ten Commandments. Keep this member of the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It goes on to say, six days shall you work and rest the seventh. Well, in America, most people work five days or they're retired and don't work any days. And so Sabbath, the um, <clears throat> the concept of Sabbath, some denominations have it in sa on Saturday, some have it on Sunday. The Jewish uh, religion still has it as Saturday the Sabbath from sundown Friday night until sundown Saturday. The concept of Sabbath and keeping the Sabbath can get very confusing unless you remember what it's there for. On God created the, the everything in creation in six days and on the seventh he rested. It's called the Sabbath rest. Keep the remember Sabbath day, keep it holy. What it's saying is that God wants you to honor and recognize him and rest in him, giving him that one day. Now, some people don't have Sunday off. Some people don't have Saturday off. Their days, days off are in the middle of the week. Shift work will do that to you. Uh, you have to deal with that in the way that you can. I've had uh, I've had shifts where I worked from Friday night at 11 o'clock. My first day off was Wednesday. And I didn't come go back to work till Friday. So I spent that Wednesday uh, preparing. Actually, I got off on Tuesday. And I spent that Wednesday preparing for what I was going to do. And I took one whole day and I spent time worshiping the Lord and I spent time uh, baking and doing different things. I was single, so I could take that day and just focus. After I got the me out of the way, I started learning things from God. Some of the things I learned was the more I took time to celebrate him, the better my life got. I was more rested. I had more energy. Excuse me as I yawn. <laughs> I had more going on in my life. My life actually took a turn for the better. So remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, because God wants you to rest, but he wants you to honor him as well. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we pray for a number of people. Rita Hoffman, Kathy Fairley, Keith Wilson's family, Lisa Hunsell, Levi and Destiny Miller, my mom, my Aunt Jane, a, a few unspoken requests, Robin, Robin Ballinger, Steve Rippey, Mark Fairley, Sam Crabtree, Simone Red Bear. Uh, there's a few others. I know you guys have requested, and I just want to say that we have a lot of people that are requiring healing or direction or deliverance or some kind of a uh, of a special touch from God. And these have been asked for, so we are uh, lifting these people up. As we go before the Lord in prayer, we will be praying according to uh, Psalm 122.6 which says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you.
We also pray for workers for the harvest, disciples, people that want to teach and train others in Christ. A better word for discipler in our vernacular is parenters, parenting, fathers and mothers of the faith. Today being Father's Day, we're praying for those that will step up and teach and train and lead and guide and, and show the way, being men of God so that the future generations can get a concept and, and follow. We pray for the spiritual state of wickedness in our metro area. We already have the victory. We pray in the areas we have standing, in our city, our county, our state. Whew. In Kansas City, we have a federal region. You all, We all have federal regions. We have a federal region that encompasses, in Kansas City, it encompasses both sides of the state line. So it's the entire metro area and around. We pray for our nation, our nation's government, those elected officials, and every place that our, uh, our uh, military has uh, people because they're in harm's way. We're praying, uh, according to Matthew 18, whatever you bind on earth should be bound from heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loosed from heaven. So as we're praying against spiritual wickedness, we're praying for those things to be bound. But we're praying that the Holy Spirit be loosed into hearts and lives and homes, into people's lives, that people start seeing and believing, getting hungry for the things of God. Then we pray for those that need jobs or need an income boost or an uh, outgo decrease that God will bless. And then we offer an opportunity for any prayer requests that you have on your heart that you haven't let us know about, that you just want to pray about yourself. If it's according to the will of God and the word of God, I add my faith with yours. So let's pray. Father, we pray for all of these people that we've named. Rita, Kathy, Keith Wilson, Lisa, Aunt Jane, Mom, Levi and Destiny. Some unspoken requests. Rob and Robin, Steve, Mark, Sam, Simone, and a few others, Father, that aren't named here specifically. But you know, we've been asked to pray for them. And we ask you to lead, guide, direct, heal. <clears throat> restore to each one of them that those things that the enemy has has tried to steal, kill, and destroy in their lives they would be restored to health and even those things that have been negative or, or uh, have deteriorated in their health and their lives that you would restore that if you can take a man who was dead four days and raise him back up. And he live. And he walks this earth again. And you can take your son and raise him from the dead. After being beaten and crucified. And totally drained of all blood. And you can raise him up. And he sits now at your right hand. Father, you can take care of these clay vessels. We put them in your hands. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, not only Jerusalem, but the, the nation, the government, and all peoples called by Abraham's name, wherever they may be in the world, for peace. Ukraine is crying out for peace, but they want it on equal, equitable level and not that they surrender. Israel is facing many different fronts of, of war and fighting, and we pray for peace. We pray for redemption of each one of these lives. We pray for protection over everyone who lives there. And Father, we just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray for parents of the faith to be raised up, trained up in churches to lead, guide, and direct according to the word of God, how to pray, 
how to read the word, how to study, how to be examples and live the life that you have asked us to live. We bind the spirit of wickedness in this city, in this county, in this state, this federal region, this nation, in our nation's government, in every place that our military has operations. We bind the spirit of wickedness. We stand on the word of God for this. And we loose the Holy Spirit into this city, into this county, into this state, this federal region, this nation, our nation's government, and every place that our nation has military personnel. The people's hearts and lives will be turned back to God. The people will be seeking God with a hungry heart, seeking out the, the truth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Father, we pray for those who need jobs or need an income boost, that you would open doors, open doors that they had not even tried going through. You would bring to them a job that meets their need and sustains them with more than enough. And Father, I pray for those on fixed income, that you decrease the outgo, increase the income, and give them blessing upon blessing. And we thank you, Father. And for all of these other prayer requests that people have, if it's according to your will and your way, your, your word, I add my faith with theirs as they call out to you right now with whatever their need is. It may be for salvation for loved ones. It may be for healing, sickness, disease, for that job that they've been given an offer on or, or seeking for any number of things, for things that need to be fixed around the house, some people needing companionship. Father, I pray your will in every one of these situations as they cry out to you that you meet their needs. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. If you have prayer requests and you would like us to add them to this list, you can send an email to prayer at fgfellowship.org. Tell me what the prayer request is and then tell me whether or not you want it added to these prayer requests or added to the unspoken requests. We'll do both. We'll add you to our personal prayers and not publish what it is if you say you'd rather not have that done. So you can send your prayer request to us at prayer at fgfellowship.org. As we go to the Lord regarding our offerings, I want to read out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 and 33. But before I do, you can give to this ministry if you so desire by going to fgfellowship.org. That's our website. Go to the giving tab and follow the directions either by mailing a check and it has the address there or putting your bank and routing number into the uh, link. There's a button there or your uh, debit card or credit card. Whichever you plan on doing, you can give to this ministry and God will bless you. Why? Because his word says so. <clears throat> but Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Now, first of all, those are important things, especially when you don't have any money or you're very uh, tight on your money because you, it, there's more going out than coming in. There's nothing in the pantry. There's, we don't, we barely have water. Or I don't have any clothes. I, I don't have anything to wear. Everything I've got needs to be cleaned, and that's going to take money to do that. So these are very valid concerns. God doesn't say don't worry about those or don't, don't be up thinking about those and be concerned about those. But he says don't worry saying those things. Verse 32, for the pagans run after all these things. In other words, they, those things are the most important things in their lives. Man, I got food galore. Oh my gosh, I've got uh, a refrigerator in the garage stocked with beer. 
I got this, I got that. These are the things that they run after. They run after them. Now it goes on, it says, and your heavenly father knows you need them. The mm -hmm. difference being heaping it to yourselves just to have the best clothes, the best uh, coach purses or, or Prada shoes or, or uh, the best, Zoot suit, if you're still wearing those, all these different things that people just flock after as primary in their lives. God says, don't go and worry about these things because your Heavenly Father knows that you need them. Then verse 33, very important. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. If you go to the Peace uh, Garden between North Dakota and Canada, the U.S. and Canada, it's right on the border. You actually go as if you're leaving the U.S., go through a checkpoint, and there's a, another road in between this set of checkpoints and the next set of checkpoints. You just tell them I'm going to the Peace Garden and they watch you go in there. If you keep on going, they have, you didn't declare what you were doing. But you go into the Peace Garden and it's half of it's in the U.S. and half of it's in Canada. It was built and put there as a memorial that there will never be a war between the U.S. and Canada. But right down the middle of this, there are there's a, there's a patch of grass. When you get out of your cars, it's a patch of grass with a sidewalk on either side of this patch of grass. On the one side, you're in Canada. The other side, you're in the U.S. And there's a tower like built at the end of these two sidewalks called the Peace Chapel. You walk in there, and there are slabs of granite or some form of rock with things carved in it like you would see at a, a mausoleum or whatever. You know, it's, the words are carved into it. Different peace sayings. And Matthew 6.33 is there, but it says, but seek first his kingdom and all these things will be given to you. When you read it, your mind fills in that it's scripture and that, hey, this is great. They've got scripture in here. But they left out three words, and his righteousness. If you don't add his righteousness in there, it tells you to seek his kingdom, and, these, and you'll get these things. Give to get. Hey, I'm going to have religion. I'm going to go find my God, and I'm going to seek my God, and my God's going to be like a Santa Claus and give me everything. The key phrase, and his righteousness. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. See, we're not to seek and worry about clothes and food and drink. Things that our body has need of and our father knows we have need of. We're not to worry about those and chase those as if that was the end all to be all. We're supposed to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And when you do that, things start falling into place, into order. Remember, you're more important than many sparrows. God knows what you have need of. So I'm going to pray over the gifts that have come in this week and those that are going to come in this week, that God add his blessing to not only the gifts, but also the giver. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for everything that's come in this week and how that we've been able to continue to meet the needs of those who can't make it during this time, haven't been able to make it through COVID, and been able to meet those needs. Father, I thank you for the gifts, and we accept those in your name to be used for everything you've purposed in your heart for them to do. And Father, we pray for the givers. We thank you for them, and we ask you to pour out blessings on them they cannot contain that you will sustain them with more than enough, not only for every need without a need for welfare, but every need and more than enough for every good gift. 
Father, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Sorry, I had something sitting here I was looking for. Each week we lift up the Word of God and we make our confession. I confess and I declare that this is the Word of God. God cannot lie. His Word is truth. We accept it. We believe it. We receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of the Christ's substitute work on the cross. See, Christ came and did what we couldn't do to set us free by taking our place. Mm -hmm. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. This is often called the Beatitudes. We're not going to go through all of them. But I want you to get some things out of this today. Today's Father's Day uh, in the U.S. If you're watching us in other countries, which we've had people from Kenya, from Pakistan, from England, from Morocco. And those are the ones I know about that they've let me know. But if you're watching any place other, we have a holiday of celebrating fathers on this day every year. This is Father's Day. Now, some people, some people out there had bad relations with their fathers. Don't know who their father is. Don't want to know who their father is and don't care about their father. Others have fathers that, that lived good lives and taught them great things and maybe are already gone on to their reward. Many listening are fathers. I just want to say, God bless you. God gives us a pattern. Now, this message is not going to be about Father's Day and about fathers as such. Not a traditional Father's Day message, but I wanted to at least say that for those who are watching today. But in the Beatitudes, we start with verse 1 in chapter 5 of Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Allow me to pray for God's anointing on this message today. Father, I thank you for this message, and I ask you, Father, to Touch hearts and lives. Open eyes, ears, and hearts to be able to see, hear, and understand your word and what you're saying to them today. And Father, I ask that each one mix it with their own faith so that this becomes profitable for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus says a lot of great things in uh, the Beatitudes. Many people have preached sermons and, and gave, given little plaques and things that they hang up in their house. But I, I like a different translation. It's uh, J.B. Phillips' New Testament. It's more of a paraphrase than a real translation. But he takes this and he puts it more in the Reader's Digest style of, of writing. I stand with the New King James, but sometimes we need to kind of hear what was being said in the way we think and versus the way King James writes it. So bear with me a second. These same verses. When Jesus saw the vast crowds, he went up the hillside, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began teaching by saying to them, How happy are the humble-minded! For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How happy are those who know what sorrow means. 
or they will be given courage and comfort. Happy are those who claim nothing, for the whole earth will belong to them. Happy are those who are hungry and thirsty for goodness, for they will be fully satisfied. Happy are the merciful, for they will have mercy shown to them. Happy are the utterly sincere, for they will see God. Happy are those who make peace, for they will be sons of God. Happy are those who have suffered persecution for the cause of goodness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what happiness will be yours when people blame you and ill-treat you and say all kinds of slanderous things against you for my sake? Be glad then. Yes, be tremendously glad. For your reward in heaven is magnificent. They persecuted the prophets before your time in exactly the same way. Jesus was talking to us about a different way of thinking. Not dog eat dog and scrabble for the scraps and hey, if you got left out, you got left out. Everything he talked about here was an attitude of heart, selflessness, seeking God's righteousness in his kingdom. It was a total different way of thinking. And today, we need to hear more of this because we like to say, hey, I can't let that person get ahead of me. Get out on the highways. People drive like it's NASCAR. They'll whip around you and, and cut in and you get to down the road and they pulled off at the same exit you did. They turn the same way you did. They go through the same lights that you do on the city streets. You're right there with them no matter how they take off. Everything's timed. You get there at the same time. Problem is, they've worn out their car, they've gone farther and faster, used more fuel, maybe been more aggravated, but they're just trying to get ahead of you. Everybody's racing for pole position at, at Daytona or something like that. God says, that's not how I designed men to be. That's not how I want you to be. I want you to sit and think and reflect and be better. I want you to be one of the blessed ones. If we go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we're told, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to, even to subdue all things to himself. Our bodies will be changed. This body that we are in, that's a temple of clay that uh, has fl flakes and flaws, when we get to heaven, we will end up with a glorified body, just like Christ has, because he says so. He tells us that we have we go from corruption to incorruption. And as we go through our eternal life, we will live with him wherever he is. But the first part of this verse says, our citizenship is in heaven. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you become sons and daughters of the Most High God. God is a, has a kingdom, not a democracy, not a republic, but a kingdom. We become joint heirs with Christ. We also become sons and daughters of God. Our citizenship is not of this world anymore, even though we're still here. We have our citizenship changed to becoming citizens of heaven. That is our home. That is where we're seeking to, to be. And that's where we will be. Right now, we're still here. And as we're still here, we have a different citizenship. We look at and think of these things, if we're following God's word, differently than those who are citizens here. It's not grubble in the, in the gravel to see how much you can get for here. We should be doing everything we can to send up to heaven gold, silver, precious stones. 
or in doing stuff for ourselves, we're setting up wood, hay, and stubble. As you go through life, are you giving people a glass of water, cold water, in his name? Are you wishing someone well? Or are you grumbling? That idiot should have done this and that. What's your attitude? What are you leaving as an impression here of your citizenship there? If we go to another country, while we're there, maybe you go to Italy. While you're there, people say, oh, you're from the USA. I have a cousin. I have a friend. How, what's it like here? Where do you live? Because they know we're from a different country. We're under a different set of laws and rules when we're at home. They're under a different set of laws and rules that they live by. While we're there, we're subject to the same laws and rules. You can't just go and break them because you're not a citizen. Because you're a visitor in their country under their rule of law. But things are foreign because things are different. Things are not the same as back where you had your citizenship at home. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Ambassadors for Christ. Okay, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a official envoy. We have ambassadors to various countries around the world. Most countries, anyone we have diplomatic relations with, we have an ambassador. We have an embassy there in that country. Sometimes we have multiple embassies, but we have an, an ambassador. That ambassador in that country has ability to go and interact with the politicians and the and the governments of that country and give all of the information that the host country that the ambassador is from wants to deliver if there's a message directly to that president or prime minister or uh, prime minister or premier or king our ambassador gets that message from the president and the state department gets it through channels and goes and delivers it. And when that ambassador is speaking to that, that government, it's as if that president was standing right there in front of them at that moment, delivering that same message. When December 7th happened in 1941, the Japanese ambassador received the coded message from their government in Japan declaring war on America. And they received it and they were transcribing it and coding it from their code into Japanese, then into English. So out of code and then into English so it could be delivered to. And it took a long time. So much so that the attack happened before the ambassador could get to the White House with it and deliver it. So the delivery of the terms of war and the state of war were delivered after the sneak attack. If it had been delivered before, the attack would still have happened because it would have been timed to be there. They couldn't have got the message over there quick enough to get everybody ready. It still would have happened. But there wouldn't have been the uh, the egg on their face that the emperor was was disgraced because the ambassador didn't get the message there before they attacked. As that ambassador stood before our government, our government leaders, it was as if the emperor of Japan was standing there. When they delivered the the news of we are at war with you. The U.S. said, we can tell. You've already killed many of our people. You've already attacked us. But 
federal formal declaration, okay, we're at war with you too. It delivered the full weight of that government decision to be at war. It wasn't just a man saying something. And so we as ambassadors, we are Christ ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's your message and my message to the world. Hey, God is using me as a, as a believer, you as a believer, to share the gospel in some way, through kindness, through goodness, to others, that God loves them and cares for them. Many people think, oh, sharing the gospel, you got to get a a Bible and a ball bat and beat them over the head. You dirty, rotten sinners get saved. God says that he draws you with his goodness to repentance. God doesn't demand that anybody get saved. He did everything to make everything right, to make it ready, to prepare the way. And then he says, will you come? My son's already died. He's already risen. His blood's already applied. He was made sin. He, he died for that sin in your place. I want you reconciled to me. Adam sold you into sin slavery when he disobeyed me in the garden. You can be reconciled to me through Christ, through what Christ has done. <clears throat> Many times living life being a believer, you don't have to preach. People know something's different about you. St. Francis, St. Francis of Assisi is attributed to have said, preach the gospel everywhere. And if you must, use words. The onus here is be good ambassadors for Christ by living a Christ-centered life. And people will say, there's something different about you. Man, if I had stuff going on in my life like you have going on in yours, I don't know that I could be as upbeat as you are. I don't know that I could be as, as uh, cheerful as you are or how I could go on. You're amazing. Because... First of all, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He changes us. Be a great ambassador. Your citizenship is not here on this earth as a believer. Your believer's citizenship is in heaven. That's our kingdom. That's our home. Jesus emphasized this during his trial when he was standing in front of Pilate in John chapter 18, verse 36 and 37, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore asked him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Here Jesus was standing in front of the most powerful man in all of Israel. He was the governor of the area from the Roman government. It was as if Jesus was standing in front of Caesar. This was Caesar's ambassador to this area to govern the troops and, and, and govern the citizens of that country. Jesus was speaking to him not as a, oh my gosh, I wish you would believe me, please, I didn't do anything, or as a pompous person, but a very learned royal person. Pilate had a conversation with him. 
where I'm sure that many Jews, he just considered dogs. They they grovel. They they have their 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 uh, religious ways that he didn't understand. Pilate understood power. He understood control. He understood government. And here he was, very casually asking Jesus, "Are you a king, then?" They never told me you were a king. You're a king. Says. You say rightly that I am a king. Just casually. Because he is. Jesus is our king. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. That means we have a kingdom. And we're not of this world. Or we would, as believers at the time, would have fought to keep him out of the clutches of the government. We didn't need to fight because he came for that reason. We need to remember our citizenship and our king. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, John 17, verses 14 through 16, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer to his Father, praying about you and I, only prayed that we be kept from the evil one. Only that we be kept from the evil one. He wouldn't be able to just run rampant over the top of us. But he emphasized twice that he's not of this world, and we're not of this world once we've accepted him as Lord and Savior. Why? Because he's given us his word. His word. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. The same was in the beginning with God. You go on down, verse 14, and it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's given us the word. And he is the word. He presented himself to us to make us citizens from heaven. And then he changes us and asks us to think and act and respond differently. Because we're not of this world. Amen. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If you've asked Jesus Christ into your life and you're reading through the Bible and you're reading about Paul and James and, and Peter and different ones and, and in the Old Testament, different prophets and how God poured out favor on them and watched over them, closed the mouth of lions that they wouldn't be eaten and, and uh, protected them from the giant and various things, you're reading that you are a fellow citizen with the saints and the members of the household of God. You're reading your history through them. Many people say that the Acts of the Apostles, even though pen is not still to paper as far as what's written in the Bible in Acts, we're still living in the time of the Acts of the Apostles. Because we are the offshoot of their ministry from, from Peter's message on, on Pentecost after Christ rose from the grave and, and ascended to heaven ten days later, the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And then he preached 3,000 souls, accepted Christ as their Savior there in Jerusalem. Jesus talks about it in John 17. That he wasn't only praying for those disciples, but for everyone who believes according to their word. And from those 3,000 on to others that kept believing and getting saved and asking Jesus Christ to forgive them of sins down through the ages until you and I, we are still those who believed on their word. We've been added to the household of God. We are joint heirs. We're still living out the book of Acts in our lifetime. God still is miraculous and doing things today. 
it's still possible for you and I if we believe because we're not citizens of this world all of our provision comes from the home country heaven Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 through 4 says blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ we like to think of Jesus as God he is and as God as God but he's also the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ why because Jesus came and became man as much as he was also God and so his father is also his God on the cross in another language Jesus cried out Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani which being translated is my God my God why have you forsaken me it was at that moment that sin had been placed on Christ so that God had to turn his back on him that he, Jesus on the cross called him my God Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Do you need a spiritual blessing? Ephesians 1.3 says he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing. It's yours. Yours to accept just as, like salvation. Father, your word says I can be healed. I'm going to be healed. Your word says that I can. you will provide for me. 2 Corinthians 9. I believe it's verse 8, that he will make provision for you that's more than enough. God, you said that this would happen, that you would watch over me more than sparrows, that you know those things I have need of. So hey, here's the things I have need of. He says every spiritual blessing he has blessed us with in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, now, another scripture says that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world. And God set his plan in order for making Adam and Eve. They'd already discussed that man was going to fall and was going to need a savior. And Jesus had already said, I will go. As far as they were concerned, salvation was already taken care of. It just had to be done on the physical cross. So the physical blood was actually shed to purchase us back from the devil where Satan had been uh, deceived Eve and Adam willfully sinned in that regard God knew everybody could be saved he's only asking you to accept freely what he's already already provided but he did that all the way from the beginning all the way through Scripture it's the scarlet thread of redemption. All the different messages and stories that we have are to point out the redemption, redemptive nature of God, and that He we point to the cross and then from the cross to now. We are the product of that redemption. Going on here from the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. So I'm, I'm the farthest thing from holy. I don't have any holes in my hands or spear in my side. I don't have any hand, nail holes in my hands and feet. I'm not holy. Holy means separated, set apart. Have you been set apart for God? Sanctified is another word that we use. See, God's the sanctifier. He's also the justifier. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you're justified. It's just as if you've never sinned. When you decide to go further in that you, you read the word further and you start being repentive of the various things that you could go and keep doing, but you, I don't want to do those things anymore. I don't, I'm changing my mind and going a different way. I was going this way. I got saved. And you know, I'm changing course because I see God says I should be thinking this way and doing these things. So I'm going to go this way. That's how we get set apart, not of this world, 
but of the heavenly world. We start realizing our citizenship and start walking according to that. And we start changing our course because we read the word of God and we follow what he says. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <laughs> Guys, many times we get blamed for things we didn't do. The dogs get blamed for things they didn't do. We could stand before God without blame. And in love. God is love. So we're surrounded by him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You became a new creation when you asked Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. All the old things were passed away and all things were become new. And God wants to continually sanctify us. Can we get better? Can we get closer to holiness? Absolutely. We will never get there before we leave this world. We're made of clay. But the more we seek his face and his righteousness, the more we will head the way he wants us to, the more we will think the way he wants us to, the more we will seek those things which are above and set our minds on things that are above instead of the things on this earth, the more we will have people say, you know, if there ever was a Christian in this world, it has to be you. There's just something about you that's different. That's living the gospel. So keep your mind on the things above. Live in this world, but remember, we have a heavenly home. We have a destination we're going to that the only way there is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And God wants us to bring as many people with us as we can. So, well, I'm not a preacher. You're a preacher. I'm not one to stand on the street corner and spout and shout. Be honest with you. I've heard street side preachers and sometimes they're angry and they, they get people mad at them. Some people listen to it. There's, there have been some people that have changed their lives because somebody preached the gospel from a street corner. I'm not saying don't do it. God doesn't call us all to be preachers. He calls us all to be disciples, which means students. Be a good student. Follow the teacher until you become like the teacher. Amen. Some of you may have been listening today and you don't even know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins. You don't know what having a, a, a citizenship other than the country you live in, what that even would be like. Jesus did all the hard work. He came and he lived and, and lived by every one of the Jewish laws. 613 you had to keep every day. He did it through his whole life. Never sinned. He didn't have to die for anything he'd done. He was a sacrifice, died for you and for me. It says he was made sin for us. He took all of our sin on the cross with him. He came as a sacrifice. All of the different feasts talk about the different sacrifices that sin is imparted onto the animal and it dies and the innocence of that animal goes on to the believer. This is the same thing on Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. He died on the cross for you and for me. But God didn't keep him dead. He raised him from the dead after three days. He, Romans chapter 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. First, you have to know why he died and that God didn't keep him dead. He rose him up to prove what his word had said was true. There's more evidence for the resurrection. Court-style evidence, witnesses and all, 
recorded in history about Jesus Christ rising from the dead than a lot of other things that people get convicted of, shreds of evidence that they, they go behind bars. Live your life on the evidence that's eternal. Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, and he did it for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to give you the opportunity to say a prayer with me and ask him into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. You say, I don't know how. I've never done it. That's, that's okay. I will guide you. I will say a little bit of the prayer, and I'll pause. If you pray what I say, but you do it from your heart, I'm just guiding you with, with, with some words to help you. But if you really mean it from your heart, God will hear your heart right where you're at. Let's pray. Dear God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize that Jesus died for me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Make me that new creation that you talk about in your word. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I confess him as Lord of my life now. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. Welcome to the family, the family of God, the kingdom of God, and the citizenship of heaven. I'd like you to contact me. You can send an email at contact us at fgfellowship.org and let me know that you prayed this prayer, what day you prayed, uh, what message. This is the June 16th, 2024 Father's Day uh, Sunday message, what day you listened, what, mess, what uh, message it was, where you hear, are listening from. And I'd love to celebrate with you and, and contact you through back through email to, to just praise God with you and then give you some guidance and some, some help in how to find a good church if you don't already have one or don't know of one. God bless you. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship here in the South Kansas City Grandview area. We close each week with our benediction. It's a Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And if this doesn't talk about a father, God being our father, the last verse, how he lifts you up like a father holds a child up and beams up into their face. I don't know what verse does. Anyway, verse 24. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and the Lord give you peace. God bless. I'll see you next week. Until then, Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship.